much of whose reserves are in Namibia, Australia with extensive untapped deposits, and Canada, Europe's principal supplier. A few other countries have fairly large resources, but the reserves are either still undeveloped or else unlikely to be available for export. Yet the quantities of uranium which will be needed from these few suppliers to cope with nuclear expansion plans around the world are enormous. This year's requirement of 30,000 tonnes could soon look puny, and so could the annual discovery rate of 65,000 tonnes, which will be less than the annual demand within seven years. By 1990, the annual requirement for uranium could have climbed to nearly 100,000 tonnes. And by the year 2000, even that figure could have doubled. Sometime towards the end of the 1990s, as the demand curve soars, the total amount of uranium needed exceeds the world's known reserves. which is why the exploration effort is being stepped up. Nowhere is that effort more intensive than in the energy-hungry USA. This helicopter is taking part in the most ambitious search for uranium ever undertaken. Trailing instruments to measure variations in the magnetic field and with sensitive crystals on board to detect any radioactivity, it's possible to make a fairly crude assessment from the air of how much uranium there is near the surface. The plan is to map the distribution of uranium over the whole of the United States. Flying alarmingly close to the ground, aircraft like this will travel backwards and forwards from one side of the country to the other. It'll take about 11 years to complete the project. So far, they're about halfway through, and they've been concentrating on the most likely areas, like this high country on the border of Colorado and New Mexico. The project's run by the Department of Energy and it's called the National Uranium Resource Evaluation Program. No one has ever tried such a systematic and methodical approach before. The aerial survey is just one part of the program and all the information is fed into computers and displayed on uranium contour maps. When the project's completed in 1985, they hope they'll know exactly how much uranium they've got. Radiometric survey of the Pocatello that means backing up the flying teams with ground crews who can take a closer look at any areas of interest. Samples of stream sediments, water samples, soil samples, all can be used in the quest for uranium. The ground, which looks promising, is subjected to a coordinated assault. Now they can take much more detailed measurements of ground radioactivity and dig up samples of the earth for laboratory analysis. They're looking not only for uranium, but for minerals which are known to be associated with it. The project's also being used to develop new prospecting methods. The main problem is how to find uranium which may be buried deep beneath the surface. And taking water from a stream, for instance, is a surprisingly powerful technique. It means that in one small bottle, you've got a sample from the whole of a river basin. If the sample's positive, you can work your way upstream till you find the source. Even deeply buried uranium should leave a trace. And there should be other clues as well. Seeping up through the soil from any deep deposits will be minute quantities of gases. Gases like helium, produced as a result of alpha radiation, and radon, one of uranium's daughter products. These readings should detect uranium as much as 1,000 feet below the surface. And all of the results go into the computer. So far, this enormous project has stimulated a great deal of research into new prospecting methods, but identified no major new reserves. But the Americans are confident they'll find them, and the hunt goes on.
Whatever they find will be for domestic consumption only. The rest of the world will have to look elsewhere. And a good part of it has descended in force on one small area a little further up the map. The uranium Klondike of the 1980s is in northern Saskatchewan, Canada. It's been known there was some uranium here for 30 years. But just recently, the tranquility of this deserted land of lakes and forest has been completely shattered. The whole area is swarming with prospectors, and not just Canadians. The Americans are up here as well. The Japanese have arrived, and so have the Europeans, the French, Germans, Swiss, Spanish, and the British. Our own central electricity generating board is a member of one of the consortia. This small settlement of La Ronge has become their base. It's the end of the paved road, and from here the uranium men must fly another two to three hundred miles north to reach their exploration camps. There's one to get four. Everything they need has to go in by air. Fuel, food, clothing, spare parts. From La Ronge, the aircraft fly a continuous year-round shuttle service out into what used to be uninhabited waste. When the lakes freeze from October to April, the floats will simply be exchanged for skis. And what is it that's brought the prospectors buzzing in such numbers? The world's biggest honeypot is a basin of uranium nearly 200 miles across. The uranium that was known to occur around Uranium City, it's now suggested, may extend over the whole of a geological feature called the Athabasca Basin. And down there are some of the richest uranium deposits ever found. The lakesides are dotted with literally hundreds of exploration camps. From these temporary encampments, the exploration teams fan out through the surrounding forest. This is the sort of country where you may stumble upon a boulder made up of 50% uranium. Do you want to come over and take a look at this? I think we've got ourselves a bonus boulder. It was extraordinary finds like this that started this whole bonanza. Right off scale. scale again. And in the wake of the exploration teams come the drillers. It's their job to find out how deep the deposits extend. Extracting core samples from as much as a thousand feet down, they obtain a cross-section through all the rock strata below them. And this part of Saskatchewan, they're discovering, has a great deal of uranium. Within a few years, it'll be to here and to the largely untapped reserves in Australia that the West will have to look for its supplies. But it puts this enormous deposit in perspective and is a measure of the uranium problem to realize that in the 1990s, we'll have to find and mine a new Athabasca Basin every two years. And simply finding the uranium may not be enough. Five hundred miles to the south, Saskatoon is fast becoming Saskatchewan's uranium capital. Since they took the decision to go ahead with uranium development, the money has been pouring in. And most of the people, long the poor relations in the Canadian Federation, aren't complaining. But some most certainly are. Out in the west where the cold winds blow, there's a land of which we all know. Some folks call it next year land, but it's just we're all a little slow. But never fear, next year is here. Bring out the bands and get some beer. It's a time. Pleasure, a time for fun. Saskatchewan's found uranium. Well, we'll get rich quick and we'll celebrate. We 
don't mind eating that yellow cake It won't be long till our dollars go We may too, we just don't know But what the hell, what have we got to lose? I don't mind losing, but I'd like to choose So please, Mr. Blakeney Not Premier Blakeney, but in the same party and a newly elected member of the Assembly is Peter Preble. My feeling is that, uh, that Saskatchewan, first of all, should be setting an example to the world of a country that, dis you know, of a province that, despite the fact that it could make large profits on uranium development instead, because of the risk of uranium being used for nuclear weapons, withholds its uranium from the world market arguing that it will not put it on the world market until there are meaningful international safeguards. That is what I'd like to see the government of Saskatchewan doing. And I think that the next step to that is then for the government of Saskatchewan to go to other suppliers of uranium, such as the Australians, and say to the Australians, clearly uh, the non-proliferation treaty is inadequate. Clearly there's a risk that uranium will be diverted for nuclear weapons. Will you join us in withholding uranium from the market until there are meaningful international safeguards? That Canada and Australia might unite to withhold supplies is a real enough possibility to give the consumers pause for thought. Clearly, there's every chance that one day the producers might form a cartel. During the 70s, the insecurity of having to rely on just four big producers began to be felt. In Canada, as Saskatchewan drains its lakes in preparation for the opening of the first of the new mines in 1981, political pressure to halt development completely is mounting. But already, in an attempt to limit weapons proliferation, the federal government imposes restrictions on the export of uranium and its subsequent movements. In the last few years, this has resulted in Canada cutting off supplies even to its own allies in NATO. The position is very similar in Australia. There, strong opposition to uranium resulted in the Labour government freezing development and exports through most of the 70s. Protesters were concerned about the weapons issue, about the environmental cost of uranium mining and about displacing Aborigines from their traditional lands. A change of government and deals with the Aborigines have given the uranium trade the go-ahead. But for how long? And what happens if the government changes again? As in Canada, the trade is even now hedged in with safeguards. Safeguards which, for example, would theoretically prevent Australia from supplying the EEC. During the 70s, Britain has turned to South Africa. It's the source of 50% of our uranium, but most of it comes from here, Namibia. There are no open protesters. But down there, there's a guerrilla army fighting to establish that what's going on is international theft. In Britain, it's generally accepted that in the not-too-distant future, this source of supply may well be cut off. And that leaves just the USA. Despite its enormous reserves, the US is an importer, not an exporter of uranium. By the 1990s, it's expected that it'll be competing for dwindling world supplies. Meanwhile, through its role as a supplier of nuclear technology and facilities, the US has succeeded in imposing further sets of restrictions on the uranium trade, again as a means of limiting the spread of nuclear weapons. The response of the uranium men to this barrage of restrictions has been to form a club. It's in the heart of London and it's called the Uranium Institute. Its membership reflects the extraordinary interdependence of the uranium miners and the nuclear industry. Each one depends exclusively on the other. They're all in the same boat and most of them belong to the club. Their first concern has been to try to avert the possibility that governments might again in the future arbitrarily cut off what are seen here as essential fuel supplies. Their Secretary General is Terence Price. I think we must start from, the, uh, from what I regard as a fact, that non-proliferation can only be dealt with politically. And therefore, the search must be for uh, political ways of mitigating, and hopefully totally mitigating, any dangers uh, of nuclear proliferation. 